Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for your presence here this evening at our Bible study. Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, we thank you because of the fulfillment of your promise that where two or three are gathered in your name, there you'll be in their midst. Holy Spirit divine, we thank you because you have graciously presented yourself in our Bible study so that your blessing will rest upon us as we read your word. Spirit of the living God, we are praying that you'll open our understanding and we'll understand your word, the revelation you are giving us today in Jesus' name. We pray, O Lord, that this word will sustain us, will support us, will strengthen us, will make us the kind of Christians we ought to be in Jesus' name. We pray you keep us awake and at alert so that the spirit of slumber will not be upon any of us. In Jesus' name, we pray. We're now in Revelation chapter 10. We've been studying from the book of Revelation. And it's been a great, great revelation to us. As we come to this chapter, we want to say that this chapter, together with the first 14 verses of the next chapter, they actually form an interlude. That means an interval. That means a pause. It's between the events of the sixth trumpet and the events of the seventh trumpet. If you have been following us in our study, already you know that seven angels were holding seven trumpets ready to blow the trumpet. And the one, two, three, four, five, six trumpets have been blown. It remains the seventh trumpet. At the blowing of the seventh trumpet, uh, the conclusion will almost be coming to everyone. Because it says in Revelation chapter 11 verse 15, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. That means at the time of the sounding of the seventh trumpet, then you'll be having the conclusion of the matter, which means it will be the coming of the kingdom of God. When the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and the Lord will reign forever and ever. I need to tell you another thing, that the period of the seventh trumpet is it's not just a day, it's not just a moment of time. The blowing of the seventh trumpet will actually look like a process of time. And within that process of time, the kingdom of God will be accomplished. Look at chapter 10 of Revelation verse 7. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, in the days, in the period, in the time of the voice of the seventh angel, when it shall begin to sound, that tells you then the sounding of the seventh trumpet is going to take some moments. It's going to take a period. Then it says, the mystery of God should be finished, accomplished, finalized, as he has declared unto his servants the prophets. But we're now in an interval. Before the sounding of the seventh trumpet, the Lord is going to show us some revelation. Before that, seventh trumpet. The seventh trumpet signals the final overthrow of the formidable power which had opposed the reign of God on the earth. And the reign of righteousness. When the seventh trumpet is sounded, then the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And then he will reign forever and ever. I read that to you already in Revelation 11 verse 15. But you understand that although many have been saved and washed in the blood of the Lamb. As they place their faith in Christ during the period of the opening of the four six seals. Many others are still hardened in their sin. The judgment of God revealed and unleashed on the inhabitants of the earth. When the sixth, trump, when the sixth seal is broken, it had not produced repentance in them. It had not produced the fear of God in them. It has not given them faith in Christ, nor transformation of life. The same sins of occultism, of false worship, of idolatry, of murders, 
of witchcraft, of fornication and theft, continued, and the hearts and the minds of the men were hardened and confirmed in these abominations more and more. Uh, look at the last two verses in chapter 9. In chapter 9 it says, And the rest of the men, which were not killed by this place, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils, or, and the idols of gold, and silver, and brass, and stone, and wood, and of wood, which neither can see, nor hear, nor walk, neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their selves they had added themselves but we come to this chapter and the next chapter the attention of the of the apostle john for a time for a period for this interval is torn from the condition of the hardened men and women in the world to this new vision concerning the mystery of god you'll find that the major thing here is the mystery of God. That's why you have in that chapter 10, that's why you have verse 7, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when it shall begin to sound, the mystery of God shall be finished, accomplished, finalized, as he has declared to the servants, the prophets. This parenthetical vision, that is this interval, this period of a pause before the blowing of a final trumpet is done or accomplished in chapter 11 verse 15. John saw a mighty angel coming down from heaven with a little book in his hand. It is stood on the land and on the sea and he announced that there will be no more time, no more delay. The mystery of God, which had been declared by the prophets, by the, by the prophets of God, the servants of God, will soon be accomplished, will soon be fulfilled, will soon be finished. At the end of the chapter, John himself was commanded to eat the sweet, bitter little book and given the mandate, the commandment to proclaim God's revelation to many peoples, many nations, many tongues, and many kings. Open now to Revelation chapter 10, as I read to you from verse 1. Revelation chapter 10, reading from verse 1. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head. And his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot upon the earth. And he cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roareth. And when he had called, seven thunders uttered their voices, and when the seven, uh, seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. And the angel which, which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the land, lifted up his hand to heaven, and he swore by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are therein and the earth and the things that are therein and the sea and the things that are therein that there should be time no longer. And in the days of the voice of the seventh angel when it shall begin to sound, the mystery of God shall be finished as he had declared to his servants the prophets. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel and I said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up. And it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up. And it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. And what we're looking at tonight is uh, titled The Mystery of God and Its Fulfillment. The Mystery of God and Its Fulfillment. 
The passage for our study is divided to three parts. Number one, the description of the divine messenger of God. Number two, the declaration of the delayed mystery of God. Number three, digesting and declaring the message from God. Number one, the description of the divine messenger of God. As you turn back to your Bible in Revelation chapter 10, you will see that the chapter opens by telling us, and I saw another mighty angel. Here is uh, in the description of that mighty angel. John had been seeing quite a lot of things as they had been transported in the spirit up into heaven. And this time now, instead of seeing any seal broken, instead of seeing any trumpet blown, instead of seeing any earthquake or whatever, what he saw at this time was a mighty angel. And he said that mighty angel came down from heaven. And as he looked at that angel, he saw the clothing of the angel. And then he saw what was around the head of that angel. He saw the beaming light of the sun in the face of that angel. And as he looked at the feet of that angel, he saw his feet as pillars of fire. Not only that, he began to look very closely and he saw the hand of that mighty angel. And what he saw in the hand was a little book that was open. And then he saw another scene. He saw the whole universe, the whole world, made of land and sea. And he saw the right foot of that mighty angel on the sea. And then he saw the left foot of that mighty angel on the land. And then the mighty angel was standing on the sea and on the land, opened his mouth. When he opened his mouth and he spoke, it was like a lion was roaring. And then when he roared with his voice, seven angels, seven thunders uttered their voices. And John was so fascinated, he put his pen on paper. You know why? Because the Lord had told him from chapter 1, what you see, what is happening, the things that are, and the things that shall be here and after. Write everything down. So in obedience to the word of the Lord, he was about to write. And then he was told, seal it up. Seal up those things which the seven thunders altered and write them not. What we need to find out is the identity of that angel, that mighty angel. Who is this mighty angel? One, you'll see the aspect of that angel. Two, you'll see the apparel of that mighty angel. Three, you'll see the attitude of that mighty angel. Four, you'll see the action of that mighty angel. The aspect, the apparel, the attitude, the action. And also has called us to observe the aspect of this August personage. All the brightness of the sun shines in his countenance. And all the rage of the fire burns in his feet. His, see his apparel. The clouds compose his robe. And the drapery of the sky floats upon his shoulders. And the rainbow forms his diadem. That is a crown on his head. And that which compasses the heaven with a glorious circle is the adornment on his head. Behold this attitude as he put one foot on the ocean and the other foot is resting on the land. The wide extended earth and the world of water serve as pedestals for those mighty columns of feet. Consider his action. It is signed. As the sun is lifted up to the stars, to the heights of the stars, it speaks and the regions of the firmament echo with the mighty accents as the midnight desert resounds or the lion's roar. The artillery of the skies is discharged at a signal. A peal of sevenfold thunder spreads the alarm and prepares the universe to receive its orders to finish all and give the highest grandeur, as well as the utmost solemnity to the presentation it swears by him that liveth forever and ever that there'll be no time anymore. Who is this? It's Christ. Christ our Lord and Christ the King. But you said, but he's referred to as angel. How can he be referred to as angel? Please understand, all that we're reading in the revelation, you know, it is symbolic. 
And what John is seeing is signified to him. It symbolized to him. It's illustrated to him. And then what he saw, it was like a mighty angel. But then, as we begin to describe that mighty angel, you know that this is none other but the king of kings and the lord of lords. You see, as he appeared before as an angel to all the people that will confirm that this mighty angel could be the Lord Jesus Christ. So yes, in Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3, you will see over here, reading from verse 2. Exodus chapter 3, reading from verse 2. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burnt with fire, and the bush was not consumed. You see, the person appearing to Moses here is referred to as the angel of the Lord. And then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. Listen to this, verse 4. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush. I thought they said the one in the midst of the bush is the angel of the Lord. Yes. And that one is referred to as the Lord and is referred to as God. It's a divine personality. It's not an ordinary angel, but he appeared to he appeared to um, to Moses at first sight like an angel of the Lord. And then when he began to speak, he realized this is God Almighty Himself. And then he said, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here am I. That tells you then that a revelation may come, and the revelation may refer to a mighty angel. But in the real sense, you are talking about the Lord God Almighty, about the Lord Jesus Christ. In Psalm ninety-seven. Psalm 97, reading from verse 1. Psalm 97, verse 1. You have seen the description of the mighty angel in Revelation chapter 10. That description tells us about the clouds around him, about the rainbow upon his head, and about the fact that his eyes, his face beamed like the sun, about the fact that his feet was like columns and pillars of fire, and he discerned a little book that was written. Look at this now in Psalm 97, verses 1 and 2. The Lord reigneth. Let the earth rejoice. Let the multitude of the isles be glad thereof. Look at verse 2. Clouds and darkness are round about him. Righteousness and judgment are the habitation of his throne. That tells you then, when you see the clouds around him, and his feet like fire, and the eyes and the face beaming with the sun, you understand you are talking about God Almighty himself that is surrounded by this glory cloud. In Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 7, reading from verse 13, Daniel 7, 13 and 14, I saw in the night visions, and behold one like unto the Son of of man came with the clouds of heaven do you see that he came with the clouds of heaven in fact anytime jesus christ refers to a second coming in the new testament he will tell the people you will soon see the son of man coming with the clouds of heaven as we read in the revelation then in revelation chapter 10 that this one the mighty angel is surrounded uh, with the cloud and the rainbow on his head on his shoulders there you understand we're talking about the son of man about the son of god about jesus christ our lord and savior himself he came with the clouds of heaven and he came to the ancient of days and they brought him near before him and there was given unto him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people and nations and languages should serve him his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed well then you understand we're talking about the lord jesus christ himself as you look at revelation you look at revelation chapter 10 and uh, you see something over here in uh, verse 2 it says and he had a little book in his hand that was open and he said his right foot upon the sea and his left upon the earth 
uh, you say, what's, what's this about? Before I tell you what that's about, uh, let's talk about the rainbow around him. In Ezekiel chapter 1, Ezekiel chapter 1, reading from verse 28, Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 28, is telling us about the bow, about the rainbow. In verse 28 of Ezekiel, as the appearance of the bow, that's the rainbow, that is in the clouds in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. And this was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. Do you see that? The, the rainbow around his head. That's uh, the glory of the Lord. When I saw it, I fell upon my face and I had a voice of one that spake. Uh, Daniel saw the same thing in Daniel chapter 10, verses 5 and 6. Daniel chapter 10, verses 5 and 6. Then I lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were guarded with the fine gold of offer. And then it says his body was like burial. And his face like the appearance of lightning. And his eyes as lamps of, the, of fire. And his arms and his feet like in color up to polished brass. And the voice of his was like the voice of a multitude. You see the various descriptions of the Lord Jesus Christ. But then now we're told that he had a little book in his hand. And this little book, we're going to come back to chapter 10. In chapter 10 of Revelation, I'm reading to you from verse 8. It says, And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again, and said, Go, and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. When we come to the third section, I'll explain that to you about the little book in the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ. But then let's uh, move on, and let's talk now about the fact that it was standing upon the sea and upon the land. What does that mean? That Jesus Jesus Christ, the mighty angel, with his feet as pillars of fire, standing upon the sea and standing upon the land. What's the significance of standing upon the land and standing upon the sea? If you read your Old Testament very well, you will understand what that signifies in Deuteronomy chapter 11. Deuteronomy chapter 11, reading from verse 24. Deuteronomy 11, verse 24. Every place whereon the souls of your fulfilled shall tread upon shall be yours. Possession. That is, when you find an individual, especially talking to the children of Israel, and especially talking to Joshua, and it says, you put your feet there, you possess it. Because the very fact that you are putting your feet there means that it's given to you. It's your promise. It's your inheritance. Every place whereon the soles of your, foot, of your feet shall tread upon shall be yours. From the wilderness and Lebanon, from the river, the river Euphrates, even unto the uttermost sea shall be your coast. Uh, that's repeated again in Joshua chapter 1 verse 3. As we look at Joshua chapter 1 verse 3, it says every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you as I said unto Moses. As you see the mighty angel then, that's the Lord Jesus Christ putting his feet upon the land and upon the sea. And when you talk about the world, the world is composed of land and sea, ocean, seas, rivers, land. And when you think about him putting his feet there, that means for possession. And the Lord is getting ready now to possess the earth again. I will surprise the earth as the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Because the Lord Almighty created everything. And Jesus Christ was co-creator with the Heavenly Father. Because he says in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And he says without him was nothing made that was made. Everything had been made by the Lord. Not only that, the Father had already committed everything to him as an inheritance. We're told in Psalm 2. Psalm 2 verses 7 and 8. Psalm 2 verses 7 and 8. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. This is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Father is referring to him as my son. As a son. Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Ask of me. And I shall give thee the heathen for an inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. 
And that's what the Lord Jesus Christ was doing now in this revelation and vision given to John. He was about to possess the world, the earth, the seas, the ocean, the land, the universe again. Because the uttermost part of the earth had been promised for, to him that it will be given to him for his possession. And he's putting his feet upon the land and upon the sea meant that the time was coming now. He was going to possess. Uh, doesn't the New Testament tell us that everything has been under his feet? In Ephesians chapter 2, chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, reading from verse 22. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22. And has put all things under his feet. And gave him to be the head over all things to the church. You see, it be, it's been given to him in promise. And he was holding on to the promise. But the Satan, the usurper, the God of this world, going about and deceiving people, he was still holding on to the world. He was holding on to all the kingdoms. That's why in the temptation, the devil was telling the Lord Jesus Christ, bend down, bow down, worship me. And then I will give you all the glories of the kingdoms. And Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan, because you will worship God and God only will you worship. Because Jesus Christ knew that eventually everything was coming back to him. Eventually he will possess everything. Now, the mystery of God. That is the, the reason why many people have been wondering. That's why it's a mystery. It is hidden. The plan of God. The purpose of God. When will Christ possess the earth again? When will Christ be master and lord and king over everything? It's a mystery. When will everything come under the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ? Under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ? When will everything be the possession of the Lord Jesus Christ? That had been the mystery. In the passage you are studying today, it's telling us that when the seven trumpets shall begin to blow, then the mystery of God shall be finished and then Christ will reign forever and ever the time is about to come now come to this as we look at revelation chapter 10 reading from verse 4 and when the seven thunders had uttered their voices i saw it i was about to write and i heard a voice from heaven saying unto me seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered and write them not you say what are those things john was not allowed to write and therefore nobody knows what those voices of the seven thunders, what they were uttering, what they were saying, what they were proclaiming. Because John was so fascinated by what he heard from the voice of those seven thunders and was about to write. And the Lord said that's part of the mystery. That's part of the things that are not revealed. That's part of the things that human beings are not privy to. They are not allowed to know it as at now. You say, are there things like that, not revealed, hidden in the mind of God? Oh yes, as you look at the word of God, you will see that God does that quite a number of times. And we're told in the word of God that that is part of the glory of God. If you knew everything that God knew, wouldn't you be God yourself? If you knew all the secrets of God, if you knew all the things that is in the mind of God, in the plan of God, in the mystery that have been hidden for ages, if you knew everything, wouldn't you be equal to God yourself? But there are some things that God will not reveal. In Proverbs chapter 25, Proverbs chapter 25, reading from verse 2, it is the glory of God to conceal a thing. It is the glory of God, the majesty of God of the most high to conceal a sin and when god conceals that sin when he says john don't try don't try it you cannot try it this what the what the thunders what they are uttering then you know that's part of the glory of god we're told in deuteronomy chapter 29 deuteronomy chapter 29 i'm reading there in verse 29 the secret things belong unto the lord our god the things that are not written that john was not allowed to write that the voice of the lord said john 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 don't write this one those secret things they belong unto the lord our god but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law 
Now, as you come back to Revelation chapter 10, and we're learning about the appearance of this mighty angel that we have known and identified and described as our Lord Jesus Christ. And you've seen the various uh, things concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, the mighty angel at this time. In this Revelation chapter 10, you have seen that he appeared, one, as a mighty angel. You have seen that, number two, he was closed with a cloud. Number three, you have seen that a rainbow was upon a head. Number four, you have seen that his face was as it were the sun. Number five, you have seen that his feet was just like pillars of fire. Have you not seen, as you look at that uh, passage, there's a little book in his hand. Have you not seen, he set his foot, he set his feet on the sea and, in the, and on the land. And his voice was so mighty and so great and so thunderous that when he opened his mouth and he uttered a loud voice, it was like if a lion was roaring. And then when he, when he uttered his voice, even the thunders, seven thunders responded and he uttered their voices. Now... As you look at this, already you understand now the rainbow upon his head. That's the picture of the mercy of God. It's the remembrance of our covenant-keeping God, the covenant-keeping Lord. You remember when Noah had come out of the ark, and then he made a sacrifice to the Lord. And the Lord promised him that there will be a rainbow. Every time you see that rainbow, it means, I'll remember mercy. In the midst of judgment, there will be mercy. And I will no longer destroy the earth or the flood anymore. And then when you think about his feet as pillars of fire, if you remember, we studied that in chapter 1, as we saw the glorious vision of the glorified Christ. That's a picture of the judgment of God because he has appointed a day in which he will judge all the actions of man by that man, Jesus Christ, whom he has raised from the dead. And so his feet like, like burning coals of fire or his feet like pillars of fire is the picture of the judgment of God and now his face. As it were the sun, indescribable glory and brilliance, so glorious that a man could not look upon his face unshaded with unshielded eyes. And then as he set his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot upon the land, it's a sign of possession. Christ our Savior, Christ our Lord, Christ the King will soon possess all the creation of God. Everything you see and everything you cannot see, all the earth and all the land, all the sea, in fact the whole universe. And then he makes a solemn oath, an affirmation that time has come. And that there will be no delay any longer. The time of possession has now arrived. That leads us to point number two. The declaration of the delayed mystery of God. We we'll look at Revelation chapter 10. Revelation chapter 10, reading verses 5, 6, and 7. And the angel which I saw, we have identified him now, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, the mighty angel. That's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. The angel which I, which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven, and he swore by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that, that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are and the sea and the things that are therein that there should be time no longer that is there should be no extra time given to the devil to mess around anymore there should be no time given no longer time given to all the usurpers to usurp the possession of the earth anymore it means that no delay anymore that this is a time now that's why it says in verse 7 but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel Angel, when he shall begin to sound the mystery of God, the sin, the purpose of God, the plan of God, the recovering of the earth, the mystery of God shall be finalized and accomplished and finished as he has declared to his servants the prophets. Now we come to look at this passage very, very closely. As you look at verse 5, it says that this mighty angel, the Lord Jesus Christ, as is already identified, uh, that he saw standing upon the sea and upon the land, about to possess the land and the sea, about to possess the earth and the whole universe, he lifted up his hand to heaven. He lifted up his hand to heaven. 
And then he swear by him that liveth forever and ever. What does that mean? To lift up the hand to heaven. You see, when you study different parts of the Bible, that helps you to understand as you come to Revelation. You study the Old Testament very well. And you see the declarations of the Lord and the declarations of the prophets in the Old Testament. It makes you to understand all these phrases that were coming across. Lifting up his hand to heaven. Let's see what that means as we look at Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 39 and 40. In verse 39, it says, See now that I, even I, am He, and there is no God with me. I kill and I make alive, I wound and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. For I lift up my hand to heaven and say, I live forever. Do you understand what this means? God was talking to the children of Israel. And was saying, there's no other God with me. I'm the final authority. Whatever I say, whatever I declare, whatever I purpose, whatever I plan, that's final. And there is no one that can contradict anything I say. As a result of that, as a symbol of that, I lift up my hand to heaven. And I say, I live forever. And nobody can contradict that. So, as you come to Revelation chapter 10 then, and it says, I saw that one upon the land and upon the sea he lifted up his hand and then he swore by him that liveth forever and ever it means what he was going to say this is final satan cannot contradict this one evil spirits cannot contradict this one there is no extension of time extra time for the devil his time is coming to an end because the mighty one the mighty lord jesus christ lifted up his hand to heaven and he declared and he swore by him that sat upon the throne you see that same expression in ezekiel chapter 20 ezekiel chapter 20 reading verses 5 and 6 in ezekiel chapter 20 verses 5 and 6 and say unto them thus says the lord god in the day when i chose israel and lifted up mine hand unto the seed of the house of jacob and made myself known unto them in the land of egypt when i lifted up mine hand unto them saying i am the lord your god do you see here god is saying do you remember when i came to you and i was to deliver you out of the land of egypt and do you know what happened then i lifted up my hand and when I lifted up my hand, the symbol, it means that even Pharaoh and all the magicians will not be able to effectively, successfully resist my authority. That's the meaning. That when the hand is lifted up like that, whatever was declared, whatever was purposed, was final. And there was nobody that could contradict that in the day in verse 6 that I lifted up my hand unto them to bring them forth of the land of Egypt into a land that I had espied for them flowing with milk and honey which is the glory of all lands look at verse 15 it says yet also I lifted up my hand unto them in the wilderness and that I would not bring them into the land which I have given them flowing with milk and honey which the which is the glory of all lands you remember their story they offended God in the wilderness and then God said, Moses, you know what? I disinherit them. They will not get to the land of uh, to the land of Canaan. That is a promised land. And then God did something. He said, I lift up my hands. And once he lifted up his hand, what he said was final. Moses could plead. Anybody could plead. They'll say, Moses, keep quiet. I've lifted up my hand. And when I lift up my hand and I make a statement, that statement is final. That's exactly what happened to them. Look at verse 16 in that same Ezekiel chapter 20. Because they despised my judgment and walked not in my statutes, but polluted my sermons. For their heart went after their idols. Verse 23, verse 24. I lifted up my, my hand unto them also in the wilderness that i would scatter them among the hidden disperse them through the countries you remember now what it means to lift up the hand it means once god lifts up his hand and he says this is final no pleading no fasting nothing will change this i will scatter them and he scattered them that's why they were scattered in different parts of the world because they had not executed my judgment and had despised my statues and had polluted my sermons and their eyes were after 
their father's idols. Ah, but there's something here now. Because God had already said something to Abraham. And what he said to Abraham was also by the lifting up of the hand. And look at these children of Israel. He said something to them. He lifted up his hand. And now he remembered he had lifted up his hand also in talking to Abraham in verse 42. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. Verse 42. Ye shall know that I am the Lord. When I shall bring you into the land of Israel, into the country for the which I lifted up my hand to give it to your fathers. He scattered them because he had lifted up his hand. And then he regarded them again to the land of Israel because he had lifted up his hand and he had sworn to their fathers. You understand now when he talks about lifting up the hand lifting up the hand when the hand is lifted up like that whatever is said that's final please come back to revelation chapter 10 in revelation chapter 10 verses 5 and 6 and the angel which i saw stand upon the sea and upon the upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever that is he affirmed this unchangeable infallible truth a truth that cannot be contradicted or changed or turned around or violated by the devil or by anyone. And he swore by him that liveth forever and ever. Who is that one? It's the one that created the heaven and the things that they are in earth. Who is this one? The one that created the earth and the things that they are in earth. Who is this one? The one that created the sea and the things that are therein. And now, who is this person? You see that in, in Nehemiah chapter 9. Nehemiah chapter 9. I'm reading to you from verse 6. Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 6. In Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 6, we want to identify him that created the heavens and the earth. Thou, even thou, art the Lord alone. Thou hast made heaven and the heaven of heavens and all their host the earth and all things that are therein and the sea and all sea, and all that is therein and thou preservest them all and the host of heaven worshipeth thee this is the lord himself the creator of the heavens and the earth and the one that created everything on earth everything in the sea everything in heaven with all the things that therein are as the Old Testament is identifying the Lord God Almighty as the creator of all things in the whole universe, so the New Testament is doing the same. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 14, Acts of the Apostles chapter 14, looking at verse 15, verse 16, and verse 17. Acts 14, 15. It tells us here, and say, sirs, why do ye these things? We also are men of like passions with you and preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities unto the living God. Who is that living God? The living God which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein. Uh, you will see then as we talk about the one that created the earth and all things therein, the heavens and all things therein, and the sea and all things therein. We're talking about the living God, the God of heaven, who in times past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness, in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. So then, what we discover is the Lord himself, who has done all this you see this mighty angel recognized and identified as the lord jesus christ that john said i saw him he was standing upon the sea and upon the earth he lifted up his hand to heaven i told you already the lifting up of the hands to heaven was just the usual attitude of taking an oath as if one called heaven to witness and then he swore by him that liveth forever and ever the oath the affirmation is made in the presence of the ever living god who is acquainted with the truth of what is to be affirmed here he is the one that created heaven and the things that are therein the earth and the things that therein are and the sea and the things which are therein god the creator the maker of all things in heaven on the earth on in the sea and throughout the universe the lord jesus christ the son of god to whom the father has given the heathen for his inheritance and the uttermost part of the earth for his possession affirmed before God, before the creator, before the, but the possessor of infinite power and who has given him the right to rule and control all things. He affirmed and he swore that 
time of fulfillment will no longer be delayed. That's why it says in that Revelation chapter 10, Revelation chapter 10, it said that there shall be time no longer. Time no longer. That is, no more delay. Because in verse 7, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when it shall begin to sound, the mystery of God shall be finished. And uh, he, as, as he has declared to his servants, the prophets, you understand now what the Lord Jesus Christ is saying? He's saying the, the time is about uh, to be fulfilled. When he will possess everything. And this is called the mystery of God. This mystery. What's the mystery? The mystery of God is the purpose of God. Which had been concealed. And which had not been fully communicated to man. This mystery. The divine purpose. Number one. Concerns the destiny of the world. What's going to happen to the world? What's going to be the end of all things we see now? Is the devil going to be allowed roaming up and down to and fro? Is the devil going to be allowed to usurp authority over all the earth? What's the destiny of the world? That's the mystery. Number two is the setting up, the mystery of setting up God's kingdom. All the prayer we've been praying. Our Father which art in heaven. Uh, hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come when is it going to be that has been the mystery and the church have been wondering when will this happen when the kingdom will get out when the glory of the kingdom will get out of the hand of satan and will be in the hand of the almighty god and the kingdom of god will be established that's the mystery that's what he's saying here that the mystery will soon be established number three is talking of the reign and the dominion of christ on the earth Oh Lord, this is a mystery because Daniel told us that he saw the Son of Man as he came to the ancient of days and then it was given to him to have dominion and he reigned over all the earth. We're looking for the time. We're waiting for the time. We're watching for the time. When is that going to be? The time is a mystery. When Christ will reign and he will have dominion. Number four, is talking about the, the, the establishment of righteousness on the earth. That is, he will make an end of sin and it will establish righteousness on the earth what will it be we've we'll been waiting for the fulfillment of that promise because we see in every city in every village in every state and in every country in every continent all over the world we still see that evil is prevailing and sin is spreading when will he finish sin and establish righteousness on the earth the time is a mystery it's have been hidden and the prophets have been talking about it he will establish his righteousness and that mystery the lord said is about to be fulfilled number five is the overthrow of satan and all his works oh lord we want to see what you said that the lord will subdue the devil satan under your feet shortly that shortly is taking a long time lord when will it happen and the dragon was dreaming out was cast out and then they overcame him by the blood of the lamb by the word of their testimony and they loved not their lives unto the death when is it that will totally overcome and then the devil will not be in the world anymore usurping authority and deceiving people that's the Mystery. And that's what he's saying here that the mystery of God shall be finished, finalized, and, and accomplished as he has declared to his servants the prophets were thinking of the time of the end of all evil. This mystery had been progressively re revealed unto the prophets, in particular for the children of Israel. That's a mystery they were thinking about, those children of Israel. Because the children of Israel, eh, they were thinking of when the Lord will deliver them. And when they will not be slaves anymore, either to the Roman government or to Greek or to any other person, but they will be totally free. And all Israel shall be saved. Turn your Bible to Romans chapter 11. In Romans chapter 11, reading from verse 25. Romans 11 verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery. That's the mystery. This mystery. Lest ye should be wise in your own conceits. That blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be coming. And so all Israel shall be saved. All Israel shall be saved. When will that be? That's the mystery. 
That's what we are waiting for. When all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. That's the mystery they've been waiting for. In Romans chapter 16, reading from verse 25. Romans chapter 16, verse 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. According to the revelation, the declaration of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations and for the obedience of faith to God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. And everybody said, Amen. In Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 3, we're looking at the continuation of this mystery. And this is what the Apostle John is now talking about as it was revealed unto him in Ephesians chapter 3, reading from verse 3. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. As I wrote her for in few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of the promise of in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches the mystery of Christ unsearchable riches unsearchable riches the mysteries of Christ and to make known and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world has been hid in Christ who created all things in God who created all things by Jesus to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose that's the mystery the eternal purpose which a purpose in Christ Jesus our Lord now the Lord is telling us as we look at this passage that during the time of the great tribulation as they go beyond as they are going near the midway of of that great tribulation then it means that the mystery the hidden thing will soon now be accomplished and finalized and fulfilled and as John was in this seeing this vision up until this time come back to Revelation chapter 10 up until this time he had just been an onlooker he had been a person just looking at and then writing he had no connection with the revelation or the vision it's like a person that is watching drama that is watching a film he is not one of the actors in that film it's not one of the participants that are acting out in that uh, drama but now the scene is going to involve him is going to be part of the drama now. That's what we come to in Revelation chapter 10. Revelation chapter 10, I'm reading to you from verse 8. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. That is, John, be become part of the whole drama now. Become part of the vision yourself. And go to that uh, angel, that mighty angel, the Lord Jesus Christ. And see that little book in his hand. Take that little book that is open in his hand. And I went unto the angel. And I said unto him, give me the little book. And he said unto me, take it and eat it up. Take it and eat it up. Ah, take it, read it, no. Take it, open it, it's open already. Take it and do what? Eat it up. You say, how can somebody eat up a book? I uh, will say that even in a language. In a language, whenever we're speaking, that somebody, when you want to say that somebody is, uh, you know, a bookworm, when you take a bookworm, what does a worm do? A worm eats up things. When you put some things, uh, maybe in the kitchen or in a, a, in a swampy place or a damp place, there's ah, some worms have come in here and they have eaten up all the things there. When you say a bookworm, that means somebody that is eating up the book. 
that is studying the book, that is digesting the book, that is reading everything, and he doesn't do any other thing just, just, just to read and read a bookworm. Not only that, we have another expression when we speak of devouring a book. And then when, our, when students are talking to one another, they said, oh, that, that young man, he has devoured that whole book. And you see every page marked. He has marked everything. He devoured the book. That's what the Lord was telling John here. Eat it up. This book, you read it, you meditate on it, and you think about it. You digest the content, and you understand the content, and then you give out the content. And it shall make thy belly bitter, and it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand, and I ate it up. And it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again uh, before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. As we come to the last part of this uh, chapter, uh, you will see something here that what John was told is very similar to what Ezekiel had been told in the Old Testament. Look at Ezekiel chapter 2. In Ezekiel chapter 2, Ezekiel chapter 2, you'll see the instruction that Ezekiel was given. Ezekiel chapter 2 reading from verse 8, but thou son of man, hear what I say unto thee. Be not thou rebellious like the rebellious house. Open thy mouth and eat that I give thee. I'm going to give you something. Open your mouth. And when I look, behold, an hand was sent unto me. And lo, a roll of a book was therein. And it spread it before me. And it was written within and without. And there was written therein lamentations and mourning and woe. Do you have an understanding here now that Ezekiel was uh, supposed to take a book and when he took the book he was to eat up the book and then it says that book had been written within and without and what's the content of that book lamentations that is nations will lament when they hear the content when they hear the message in the book and then they'll be mourning that means when do people mourn when people die that's when they mourn there'll be many people that will die when they hear the judgment of god and there'll be war there'll be calamities you think about what john was still going to write when you come to chapter 11 and you come to chapter 12 and you come to chapter 13 14 and all through the book of revelation before the marriage supper of the lamb what's it going to be there's going to be lamentation there's going to be mourning there's going to be a war. That's the reason why he said it will make your belly bitter. When you hear the revelation, when you receive the revelation, it will look like honey in your mouth. Because you know that you are privileged to have a revelation from the Lord. But then when you digest that sin and you think of the content and you think of the people that are going to suffer, when they hear that message, that's going to be bitter. In chapter 3 of Ezekiel, verse 1 more over, he said unto me, son of man, eat that thou findest, eat this roll. And go speak unto the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat that roll. And he said unto me, Son of man, cause thy belly to eat, swallow it up, and fill thy bowels with this roll that I give thee. Then did I eat it, and it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness that is when you consider that you are privileged to receive revelation that other people are not receiving. You are joyful. You are happy. That's the happiness part of it. That's the sweet part of it. And then it tells us from verse, uh, in verse 4, it says, And he said unto me, Son of man, go, get thee unto the house of Israel, and speak with the words, and speak with my words unto them. That is, you have taken the role. You have taken the book. You have eaten it up. You have accepted the word and received the word. You have digested the word. Speak it out. Give it unto the house of Israel. It tells us from verse 10. In verse 10, moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, all my words that I shall speak unto thee receive in thine heart, and hear with thine ears go, and get thee to them of the captivity, unto the house of thy people, and speak unto them, and tell them, thus says the Lord God, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear. Then the Spirit took me took me up and i had behind me a voice of a great rushing saying blessed be the glory of the lord from this place i had also the noise of the wings of the living creatures that 
touch one another and the noise of the wheels over against them and the noise of a great rushing listen to verse 11, verse 14 so the spirit lifted me up and took me away and i went in the bitterness and in the heat of my spirit in the bitterness of my spirit all that means is he had received the word of god and that role that he ate up uh, written within and without they're full of lamentations and mournings and woe and because of that when he got to him and it began and the spirit of god began to reveal and interpret to him all the things was to tell the children of israel he said this is bitter he knew this was bitter and because they contained mourning and woe and lamentation that's why he said when i was going i wasn't going singing and happy because i was seeing the destruction of the children of israel and i went in the bitterness of my spirit you'll find that uh, this is what happens when people receive the word of the lord you are joyful when you receive it but when you begin to think about uh, the content of what you have received it's really bitterness and uh, you think about it for example you hear of the word of the lord about heaven and about hell and about the very fact that jesus is savior and he saves you from hell and then you receive the word of god you became saved how happy you are uh, it was joyful because now even when you think about hell uh, you think about it, you say praise the lord because i am redeemed because he has taken all my sins away you say i praise him now i praise him now i will praise him praise the lamb for sinners lane give him glory all ye people for his blood has washed away my stain but then you begin to think that he is not saved mommy is not saved my brothers and sisters are not saved and you see the flames of the fire of hell and as you meditate upon that tears begin to come in your eyes the same message that made you happy just now because you have escaped the flames of the fire and the punishment of hell as you think about the other side of that message of hell of your relatives and the people that are going to hell it becomes bitter in your heart becomes bitter in your spirit and becomes bitter in your belly the joyful part is there the sweet part is there because you are saved the bitter part is there because the people that you love they are not saved yet we're told in jeremiah chapter 15 it's still about this role of a book jeremiah chapter 15 verse 16 in jeremiah chapter 15 verse 16 it says thy words were found and i did each them thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart for i am called by thy name O lord god of hosts you see what uh, the word of god is saying here and I, I sat not in the assembly of the mockers nor rejoiced i sat alone because of thy hand for thou hast filled me with indignation and you see in verse 16 the joyful part rejoicing of my heart i'm called by your name and i found your word i'm a privileged prophet i'm a privileged man that's the joyful part but then he saw that his own people are perishing if some people had not repented and then he brought the word of judgment to them and they were not repenting and he said you filled me with indignation that's the bitter part of it and that's the reason as you come to the lord and you understand that the message of life that we're preaching it has the joyful part and it also has uh, the sorrowful part there is sweetness and joy and delight in receiving and embracing the doctrines of the revelation of the word of god yet as those who receive the word will joy begin to live by the word persecutions and troubles may follow representing the bitterness that will follow the eating of the book hasn't that happened to you sometimes you have received the word of god while the bible study was going on you are so joyful i never saw this before i never knew this before and you are so happy opening your bible turning your bible and marking your bible marking the outline so happy and then you got back home you began to put the content of the message and the content of the study into practice and your neighbors begin to persecute you and trouble comes because of standing by that same word you are happy when you are studying it now as you practice it they begin to leave punishment and persecution on you that's the peter part of it this part of the vision revealed to john was a very strong has a very strong resemblance to the account that were read in ezekiel now you see whatever 
whatever joy, whatever delight John may have when he receives the message of the judgment of the world and the reign of Christ, the delivery and the proclamation of divine wrath and fury becomes a bitter experience. Because we are talking about eternal bitterness, eternal suffering for sinners. And he said unto me, thou must prophesy again. That's the last verse. That's verse 11 of Revelation chapter 10. It says you must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. As a consequence of possessing the book of divine revelation, eating it of digesting its contents, he is now sent and commissioned to proclaim the divine truth to the people on earth. You see the categories of the people that was to preach to number one, it was to preach to many people. What does that mean? Great masses of people. Number two, it was to preach to nations. That means all countries and continents in the world. It was to preach to many tongues, and that means people of different languages. Not only that, number four, kings, that is to rulers of people, without fear, without discrimination, and without any reservation. He was to preach the word of God. That's the very responsibility of the child of God today. Think about this one. That we are being told that John was told to eat up the book. How about you? How is what's your response to the word of God what's your response to be to the word of God in Job chapter 23 Job chapter 23 I'm reading from verse 12 neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food as the Lord told John to eat up that book the Lord is telling you the same thing eat up this book make it count it more important count it more essential count it uh, more valuable more profitable than your necessary food when you eat it you are going to have the same experience as john had in psalm 119 psalm 119 verse 103 how sweet are thy words unto my taste how sweet are thy words unto my taste if you're a person that is given to having quiet time family devotion when you read the bible in the morning is the most joyous part of your life when the lord begins to reveal his mind and is is a truth unto you how sweet are thy words unto my taste yea sweeter than honey in uh, to my mouth and that's the reason why it says you know what ezekiel was told fill your belly with that book with the content of that book you know what john was told eat that book and fill your inner man and fill your belly and fill your innermost being with the content of that book exactly the same thing the lord is telling you and telling me in colossians chapter 3 verse 16 colossians chapter 3 verse 16 let the word of christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom let the word of christ dwell in you richly eat up this word swallow this word meditate on this word and get this word into you and fill your belly and fill your spirit and fill your innermost being with the word of God. Let the word of God dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. As uh, you do that, uh, you understand, uh, you're not just to read it, you are to also do the thing that you are reading there in James chapter 1. In James chapter 1, reading from verse 19. James chapter 1, verse 19. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be sweet to hear. You come to church, be sweet and quick to hear. And slow to speak and slow to roar. Then it says in verse 21, Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. Lay that apart. When you come to the house of God, anything that appears naughty, Anything that appears that you are not interested in the word of God. Anything that will make people think that, ah, did they drive you here? Did they force you here? Lay all that aside and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls and be doers of the word. Be doers of the word, not hearers only. I'm sure you know Joshua chapter 1 verse 8. In Joshua chapter 1 verse 8, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. Swallow it up, eat it up, meditate on it, digest it, receive it, act on it. It says that you'll meditate upon it day and night, that thou mayest observe to do 
all to do according to all that is written therein that you'll be able to do as it is written therein look at psalm 119 in psalm 119 psalm 119 verse 11 thy word have i hid in my heart eat it up let it be in your heart that i might not sin against thee in verse 57 verse 57 it says thou art my portion O lord i have said that i would keep thy words that's what your attitude ought to be 101 verse 101 i've refrained my feet from every evil way that i might keep thy word i refrain myself i put a break on my life that I will not go this way, I will not go this way, I will not go as fast as I was going to make money to do this or that. Why? So that I'll have chance to keep your word. Verse 161. In verse 161, princes have persecuted me without a cause, but my heart standeth in awe of thy word. That is, I've received that word because of my practicing that word. When I received the word, what joy I had. It was the joy of my heart. But now, as I began to practice it, the princes they began to persecute me and there's no other reason just because of my devotion to the word of God that's the bitter part of it it will be sweet in your mouth while you are reading while you are hearing while you are studying while you are jotting down notes sweet in your mouth but now bitter because of the persecution but all the same my heart is standing in awe of thy word verse 172 my tongue shall speak of thy word for all thy commandments are righteousness the Lord is telling us how important his word is and is telling us that after we have received the word you accept the word you believe the word you understand the word you meditate on the word you act on the word you you practice the word it doesn't stop there you preach it to preach the word be instant in season and out of season reprove rebuke exhort without long suffering and doctrine for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine but after their own laws shall they heave to themselves teachers having itching ears they are, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables that the bitter part of it when you receive the word and then you are appointed to be a preacher you are joyful that's the joyful sweet part of it when you begin to preach it and you know how important the word is the word that can save them and make them make them escape hellfire and they neglect it and they turn their ears away from it as a sorrowful part of it as a bitter part of it don't let that discourage you though watch thou in all things and do affliction do the work of an evangelist and make full proof of thy ministry i pray the lord himself will help us as john responded to the message and to the vision that he received that we too will respond in the same way in jesus name why don't you rise up now and read really really pray before you go we've heard the word of god we've seen that jesus christ is the majestic one the glorious one is the one that is going to possess the heavens and the earth and the whole scene that you have in the universe he puts one foot on the sea and the other foot on the land because he's the possessor and if you will come to the lord to the side of the lord jesus christ you'll be a possessor with him you'll be you'll inherit with him you'll be an heir a co-heir with the lord jesus christ are you born again are you saved are you a child of god are you on the side of the lord why don't you call upon the lord if you have not been saved this is the time for you to come to the side of the lord and be saved and be born again if you are saved already if you are saved already you have received the word of god that's the sweet part of it how happy you are the joy of salvation the joy of belonging to the lord the sweetness of knowing that your name is written in the book of life in heaven but there's a bitter part of it when you begin to practice that word and people go against you and people fight against you and people persecute you never mind never mind that's how it is the sweet bitter experience of the world talk to the lord and say lord i give myself to you i will not allow anything whatever anything whatever anything whatever to hinder me i'll be a child of god the rest of my life born again saved sanctified purified and cleansed by the word and declaring the word without fear without favor without reservation without timidity preach the word preach the word be instant in season and out of season even though some people reject keep on preaching experience both the sweet part and the bitter part of it never give up just keep on declaring the truth of the word of god it will not be long there will be no delay any longer the lord jesus is about to come and he will establish his kingdom 
And praise the Lord, you'll be part of that kingdom too.